Good morning, everyone, at least in the US, I guess afternoon in Europe. Welcome to our European American Collaboration in Wind Energy. This is a monthly webinar series um, organized by Jakob Mann and myself as part of a project uh, that Jakob obtained through the Danish Science Foundation. So Jakob's going to introduce our speaker for today. Yes, it's a, it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Martin Dörrenkemper. Uh, he's heading a group called Numerical Yield and Site Assessment at Fraunhofer Ives, or Institute for Wind Energy Systems in Oldenburg, Germany. Uh, he has a PhD in energy meteorology and physics from uh, Oldenburg uh, University and a, a Master of Science degree in meteorology. Uh, for 10 years or more, Martin has uh, focused on research on the interaction of the atmospheric boundary layer and offshore wind farms. Uh, until last year, he has led the Crosswakes research project funded by the Ministry of Economic Affairs and Climate Action in Germany that focused on development uh, and providing large validation data sets for large scale wake effects, so farm to farm interaction basically. He's currently coordinating the follow-up project called Cluster Wakes uh, on large-scale wake effects mitigation, so how to avoid these uh, wakes uh, hitting another wind farm or dissolving faster. In addition, he's involved in the Horizon Europe uh, flow project, uh, which I coordinate, and uh, he's currently supporting the German authorities in updating the area development plans for the German Bight, one of the most densely populated offshore wind farm areas in the world. As part of uh, Fraunhofer's activity as the largest institution for applied research in Europe, uh, Martin's group has also been active in several industry projects, leading to a stronger transfer of research results to applications. So please, uh, Martin, uh, or please share your screen and go ahead with your presentation called Assessment of Large-Scale Offshore Wind Farm Effects and Their Implications for Maritime Spatial Planes. And by the way, we usually have three quarters of a presentation and then we have a quarter of an hour for uh, questions. You're also welcome to use the chat for questions. Yeah. Yes, thanks a lot for the introduction. Hello to everyone in Europe. Good morning to the ones across the Atlantic Ocean. Um, I'm very happy to be able to present our results from the Crosswake project on the one hand, also updated to what I have presented in, at some conferences before. So some more recent results that came up at the end of the project. And then I would also, um, at least for the second half of the of the presentation give some insight about how we are supporting the German government in the maritime spatial planning, including um, the German Bight, um, but also the neighboring wind farms in the in the North Sea. So this presentation is, um, yeah, let's say co-authored by a lot of people that worked on the Crosswex project. I have it later on on the slides. Um, and a special thanks to my colleague, Lukas Vollmer, um, who was doing especially the second part of the of the presentation quite quite a lot of work. To give you a very short um, introduction um, to uh, what is Fraunhofer, because that's sometimes not um, so so well known, uh, let's say um, also sometimes in the German media even, there's the, the Fraunhofer Institute has developed this and that. Fraunhofer is quite big, so there's like 30,000 people working for Fraunhofer in um, more than 75 institutes um, all around the country in Germany, focusing on, um, on the transfer of knowledge basically from universities um, towards the industrial application. So we have a very strong focus on, <clears throat> on um, transferring these results towards um, applications. As such, our institute is located in uh, the north of Germany with the headquarter in Bremerhaven and um, um, more sub uh, branches that are also located very closely related to universities. Um, so, for instance, our site where I'm currently sitting in Oldenburg um, is um, very strongly connected to the to the work that's done by the colleagues here in the building from Forbund University of Oldenburg. That, of course, most of you know. Um, while we at at the front of Institute of Wind Energy Systems are in total around three hundred. Um, 
um, staff um, working on everything that's related from the wind resource towards also um, quite a big of uh, testing of materials um, and, and uh, parts of wind turbines. And more recently, also the connection to hydrogen systems and the inter grid integration questions um, related to, to wind energy systems. But let's dig into the topic. Um, so I, the motivation for the research that we have been doing is that Germany already now has the third largest capacity of offshore wind farms connected to the grid. So on the right side, you can see an animation that's ongoing uh, with the current installations um, that are that are planned um, and uh, and in, in the next in the following next years up to 2030 um, and out of these um, currently 8.4 gigawatts which we have uh, installed capacity around 7 gigawatts are installed in the German byte so the the Baltic Sea part is is um, it's not so relevant because um, it's also much smaller the German government, however, um, that is um, yeah, that is uh, in place since uh, 2021, has significantly raised the um, the goals from formerly 20 gigawatts by 2030 to now 30 gigawatts in 2030, 40 gigawatts of installed capacity in 2035, and 70 gigawatts of installed capacity in 2045. Uh, and the areas are very limited. So we expect the worldwide highest capacity densities um, in the German bite area. And this is a quite big challenge um, for the planning and, and uh, of course, then later on also the operation of wind farms. This is, of course, mainly due to the fact that we know um, that wake losses are typically underestimated. So there were um, in a, a Previous project um, with some partners of the that later on were also working. The Crosswex project was the VPUF project, Wind Park Farfield, that did one of the first flight measurements, so in situ uh, flights in the wakes of wind farms, and showed uh, back in 2016, 17 that wakes can um, can last up to 100 kilometers under some atmospheric conditions, so mainly stable conditions. And there was a production data benchmark by Ersted that. Um, shown that the, the classical models have underestimated wakes by around 20%. And um, there is also model studies on very large wind farms that uh, show that there's a high efficiency losses, that there are high efficiency losses in large and dense wind farms, in particular also with high fidelity models. So the Crosswex project um, was a project that we um, were running, focusing on the research question on of how large wake effects um, and um, and their interaction with the atmosphere um, affect the real life wind farm operations. So you can see here already from the main research question that we had this transfer of knowledge um, directly towards the, the application um, in mind. Um, and um, that project was focusing on three areas, let's say in a way, one was um, on, on coastal effects, um, that's a part that's not so, let's say, well known, um, while there were also quite some interesting publications. Um, however, the focus of this presentation will be a bit more on um, this, the other two topics, which are kindly, kind of only split in terms of, um, of size. So we had, a, had a one a work package that focused um, on single wind farm clusters um, within the marine atmospheric boundary layer, so that had the scale up to let's say maybe a couple of hundred turbines. Um, so um, some, some 50 to 100 kilometers. And then the large, uh, the, the last point was the, the interaction of several wind farm clusters with each other. So this is really the, the Southern North Sea scale um, covering, let's say um, multiple thousands of turbines um, in, the, in the boundary layer and its actual interaction with it. Um, Crosswex had a funding of 4.3 million euros, um, national funds, um, and were run, was running for four and a half years. And the partners, the, the research partners are shown on the on the right side. Um, those are the partners that ran quite some uh, significant previous research, namely the projects of Wind Park Farfield and Gigawatt Wakes um, that, um, that were uh, leading or were the first ones that really did some research on, um, on, um, on large-scale wake effects in the German bite area back starting basically in 2010, 20, 2011, I think. Um, and then we kind of merged together the two consortia and had a big group with various uh, methods. I have that on the next slide. 
And um, in addition to those that's funded partners, we also had seven large wind farm operators in the consortium as associated partners that provided um, quite some valuable wind farm production, validation data, and also the Federal Maritime and Hydrographic Agency, the BSH in Germany, that's uh, responsible for the um, planning of, um, of wind farms in the German Bight. So in terms of methods, and we dig into that later on in, in some results, um, we had a um, focus on, um, on flight data. On the one hand, um, there was a even a short period where two manned aircrafts were operated in parallel. So we had for a couple of months, two aircrafts in parallel and were able to measure the inflow and the wake of a, of a large wind farm cluster in parallel at the height of the, of the wind turbines. Um, then we had a, um, a campaign with UAS, so with drones on testing um, those and if they, they are capable in, in, in serving in the future for, for wake questions. Um, there was some satellite data analysis, which of course definitely makes sense on these scales. And then we had stationary measurements um, of, especially of scanning lidars um, in this windward center and leeward of wind farm clusters, um, depending on, on the wind farm from wind directions. Those were also quite, quite well placed. Um, yeah, and I mentioned already, um, there was also a quite big focus on, on validating models with wind farm production data. In terms of models, um, there was a focus on engineering models on the one hand with the commercial and research uh, models so from our side, the FOXES model that's a um, publicly available um, engineering model and open wind as the commercial solution. Um, we had done, we have done quite some research also with the large eddy simulations, um, with the PAL model, and of course the mesoscale model with the WOLF model and its validation. Yeah, coming to the key results of the project, um, I've split that section into some parts, um, also focusing a bit on, on the methods and then some, some results that originate from that. So um, we were um, conducting more than 40 um, man flights that, um, that were focusing on three different topics. So the coastal effects, a global blockage effect, upstream of wind farm clusters and the large scale cluster wakes, where we were able to measure even the interaction of two wind farm clusters that were um, several hundreds of kilometers apart. Um, and then a UAS campaign, there's a picture shown here um, from the UAS um, that was flying one of the first um, flights beyond visual line of sight um, in, in Germany, um, flying a, a in in or operating west of Heligoland in the in the uh, North Sea, and those data were especially used for model validation and investigation also of fluxes above wind farms. In terms of lidar, there was, there was quite a big um, big effort by multiple institutions, um, uh, partly also supported by let's say other running activities that could then kind of feed into the project. Um, we had um, scanning lidars um, on the um, on the um, for the global blockage effects and 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 cluster wakes inside uh, the cluster N two. So this is shown here down where two scanning lidars were operational, being able to measure the inflow and the development of the of the wakes inside the cluster. There was a, um, a scanning lidar that was placed inside a not fully equipped wind farm cluster to be able to measure really what's happening downstream of one large cluster, but but with the one that's not fully operational. Um, there was a scanning ladder placed on the island of Norderney, focusing on or had a view with a view, let's say, outside towards the sea, focusing on coastal effects. Um, and we were also quite happy that we were able to um, to join. Um, Forces with the Globe project that was also presented in this um, in this uh, seminar was that last time um, and um, it uh, yeah were, were providing um, ABL height measurements because that was one of the strong of the focus points in our crosswax projects like the interaction with the atmosphere um, and a floating lidar to provide a reference measurement upstream of the wind farm cluster. So with those data, um, we were able um, to provide one of the first published measurements, um, mainly done by Jörg Schneemann from Forwind on, um, 
on global blockage with scanning gliders, paper that was uh, released in 2021 in wind energy science. And um, here's the key result of that um, in, in stable stratification um, expressed by the Obukov lengths filtered over multiple scans in a, in a certain um, wind uh, speed um, uh, bin. So that's here from 80, 11 meters per second um, with more than 70 cases. Um, we could see like a drop in the wind speed um, uh, down or, or upstream of, of the of the wind farm here. So really the, the global blockage effect. Um, and um, the paper then also was, was des describing and focusing a lot on describing um, error sources that need to be taken into account, having in mind that the this global blockage effect is by typically by an order of magnitude smaller than what we see in those uh, large scale wake effects. And so the, the measurement um, uncertainties are, are close also to the value that we are, or the, the physical process that we are interested in measuring. So this paper gave quite some insight and uh, I believe that most of these things were also um, used then in, in setting up the, the GLOBE um, project later on. Another focus um, that we had was um, developing of, um, of engineering models to capture large-scale wake effects and, and to focus on how to do that better. Um, there was basically two uh, publications that originate um, also from our group. Um, where we, on the one hand, were focusing on um, validating um, different uh, or the sensitivity of wake modeling setups with wind farm production data. I think that was presented at the talk conference um, in um, in 2022, um, where there um, where there was uh, yeah quite some some um, efforts done on calibrating the the wake uh, coefficients or the parameters um, specifically for larger scale wake effects and another focus that was also implemented and described um, in terms of a tutorial in the FOXES um, software open source is um, a focus on how to represent large scale direction changes. So here's an example up um, above from, from an SAR image in, from the German byte and below is the classical approach of engineering modeling where the inflow um, is just taken and then the wakes are profit, propagated along the um, uh, or with the inflow wind speed and direction um, of the of the individual um, clusters and what we did then or what was developed there um, is um, an approach that takes that calculates the streak lines from um, a mesoscale um, run that can be pre-calculated then and uh, then is able to let's say deflect the, the wakes and if you have a picture to, uh, look to the to the situation above you can really see that this is going into a better direction and inside that paper we also had a look what this means in terms of AEP um, when calculating long term production values. In the large eddy simulations um, cases, there were basically two topics that I wanted to show here. Um, we have been seeing in um, in the um, in in the flight measurements that we conducted, but also um, partly, I think, in, if I remember correctly, in SAR data, that there are um, streaks developing, um, which is quite quite an interesting um, phenomenon. Let's say um, from that side, with a very strong gradient um, on one side of the of the wind farm um, edge, that can then last over over tens um, of kilometers. And are not then or only very slowly starting to mix with the atmosphere. Um, and one idea that we had here is that um, the position of that streaks could be um, related, or the also the origin of that could be related to the turning of the wind in in the atmosphere. Um, and uh, that was then demonstrated with the Palm model by simulating the exact same wind farm cluster on the northern hemisphere and at the same degree of uh, latitude on the southern hemisphere. And you can really see how the streak then moves to the other side of the wind farm cluster. Um, another topic where LES was and is still used for, um, so this is the part of a PhD um, topic um, um, that's ongoing, is um, the investigation of how um, more simple blockage models can be developed. So here are three different implementations um, that are quite typical in the engineering models. Um, in colored is the engineering model solutions and in, in the dashed line, the, the LES. 
um, showing that a signal turbine in the flow is quite well represented. So in terms of the induction that's imposing to the flow, while well, this is completely off in the seven by seven wind farm case. So there was a seven by seven artificial wind farm simulated. And you can see here that the, the dashed um, contours are quite well far away from the from the colored um, schemes. So um, uh, Gabriele Centurello is um, still working on um, on suggesting Euclid blockage um, modeling approaches there. Yeah, coming to how the validation data was used. So this is the case that I kind of introduced with a few words um, already before. Um, here's an example of um, um, validation of the model. Um, um, so here's a, a southwesterly flow um, to a wind farm cluster. So there's a couple of hundred turbines operational in that uh, in that wind farm cluster. And then there's um, other turbines. Um, yeah, another wind farm cluster here that's not uh, fully equipped with wind farms yet. There's still a gap inside. And then the wind conditions were in a way that the that the um, the this wind farm cluster was hitting another wind farm cluster so that is roughly bit more than 100 kilometers downstream. So this is a really, really long distance case. And the aircraft was measuring in, in legs downstream of those wind farms. Um, and um, one can then see how different approaches. One is an, um, an uh, engineering model approach. And on the other hand, there's uh, also the Wharf wind farm, which is the Fitch parameterization in Wharf kind of um, um, are able to reproduce the the measured uh, the measured data um, and um, what is uh, also shown here and that was a key contribution let's say to these validation exercises especially in the German bite because we do see quite a lot of curtailments due to um, due to a lack in transport capacities in the grid to southern Germany in some cases so it's quite important that you take into account also the, the actual operation of those wind farms. So we really had the production data available and could see, could say um, how, how much energy the those clusters were extracting, or at least knowing which turbines are operational is a, is a key key thing um, that was important to that exercise. Um, what is kind of the summary, let's say in short, this, the, there's, this paper is currently um, in review and will hopefully soon be um, soon be available to the community. Um, is one is one key conclusion is that um, uh, closer to the wind farm, um, the engineering models are doing a quite good job. Then then further downstream um, of those, um, there's a there's an area where the the mesoscale parameterizations are are better, and the engineering models are more or less completely failing in representing the wake effects correctly. But um, another another thing is really that. The atmosphere is rarely that stationary that you can measure. I mean, this 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 measurement pattern took a couple of hours, and that's also one of the key problems that we discussed in that publication is that the conditions in the background flow, of course, also changing, and there are there are ways on on how to estimate also this change in the flow. So that might here in those figures have some some impact as well. Another um um result that will be presented at this year's um, talk conference um, by my uh, colleague Lukas Vollmer was a project internal model benchmark um, that we uh, conducted um, at two wind farms, um, Sandbank and Dantusk, that are um, separated by some uh, by some kilometers, uh, tens of kilometers apart. Um, and we were there investigating various wind directions and how then the different um, engineering models in that case, but there was also part on high fidelity models, are able to reproduce the wind farm production data. So here the SCADA data um, for various wind direction and inflows and this has then a different, let's say, shadowing of, of parts of the wind farm, which is nicely reflected here. Um, and then this was also split this data set um, because there was some stability data also available to um, different atmospheric stability conditions um, and showing that, of course, what we know um, that uh, the wakes uh, tend to be stronger and stable stratification, but also the models are then further uh, further off. Um, however, that was, uh, I think, quite a, quite a good data set because it covered really um, quite stable statistics over multiple years of, of um, wind farm operation data and um, yeah, we are currently considering of of uh, of opening this benchmark also to further activities. 
Um, the last um, part result from the Crosswex project that I want to show before moving over to the second part of the presentation where I want to go or to show you how we are supporting the German government in the maritime special planning is the validation um, that we carried out with the scanning LIDAR. So that scanning LIDAR was placed inside a wind farm cluster. So this is the N2 wind farm cluster. There's a wind farm cluster that's called N3. And that one is partly operational. There will be one part built um, in the next couple of years. We were able to place a scanning LIDAR on one of the transition pieces, um, measuring um, at a point some kilometers upstream, so really in that gap. And then for a duration of of um, of several months, so this is also quite quite a quite a big data set, so um, quite some months of data, and um, we show here um, the representation of the of the conditions um, in terms of how how well the WARF model is capable in reproducing um, the lidar data for um, a recent reference simulation. So that's the red line here um, without modeling the wake effects. The um, the blue line is the scanning LIDAR data, and the green line is the Fitch parameterization um, activated in the WARF model, where we see a very good agreement in the WARF wind farm case. And interestingly, that is true um, for, for wake effects that are a bit further away. So there's some distance, let's say, of more than 10 kilometers, but it's also true for a distance that is um, only in the order of a couple of kilometers because the, the scanning point was actually more a bit more located here. Um, so for all directions that fits quite, pretty well, also, of course, for the, for the, uh, reference case where all, um, where, where there's no weight effects at all for that direction. There are only some problems, which of course also due to model resolution in case of very, very narrow gaps here. Um, and, uh, yeah, and of course, potentially also fluctuations in the, in the flow. So the conclusion that we took away from that is that we um, have see a difference of 2% roughly on average um, wind speed over all um, wind conditions that we had here. So the, this model setup is quite well suited for cluster wake modeling. And this brings me to the second part um, of the presentation, which is on maritime spatial planning. Um, as a reminder, we have the objective of um, installing the current capacity of 8.5 gigawatts in uh, the Baltic Sea and the North Sea up to at least 70 gigawatts by 2045. Um, so the government's goal is to have always 70 gigawatts in operation because by 2045, we will see something like repowering of certain areas. So some gigawatts drop out every year and then we will have um, other um, areas that need to be there. So at least 70 gigawatts um, um of installed capacity and the request for for the from the german authority that's responsible for the planning of the areas is um to estimate the energy yield of uh, different expansion scenarios to provide a measurable feedback for their decisions analyze the impact of capacity densities uh, turbine technology and for instance turbine technology on the energy yield um, and uh, use the modeling methods that can provide a realistic picture of the wake losses so how did we do that? Um, there are quite a number of assumptions that you need to take if you look into the future. Um, and um, one of that was how, do how does the turbine technology develop? So we got in touch with um, wind farm operators and turbine manufacturers, um, took some interviews uh, and also inside our institute with the people working on blades and, and, and other turbine um, parts. Um, to, to get an understanding where we might end up um, um, when we are looking towards the 20, 2040s. And in the end, we decided to go um, in two steps. So all turbines that get operational until 2030 um, have, um, so from 2026 until 2030, because until 2026, there were already plans available um, or requests for permits, let's say. Um, there we had uh, 15 megawatt turbines with a rotor diameter of 240 meters and a hub height of 150 meters from um, 2031 until um, then the future. So this is a bit mistaken here, but because that's that's the second step that will include all uh, scenarios that we run later on. Um, so everything after 2030 is uh, 22 megawatts, 290 meter rotor diameter and 175 meter Hub height. Um, this is of course open to discussion. There are some voices in the industry that say we would potentially stay at a certain um, turbine size, and then this will be a mass product, let's say, 
um, that that will be used everywhere around. There are other voices that said we might even reach uh, 30 megawatts, although I've, I've the, uh, my, my current feeling is that the, at least recently, it's more towards smaller turbine sizes. Then um, we were mainly interested in understanding different scenarios. So running multiple scenarios um, on, on potential expansion um, and not uh, having like um, a, a good um, climatology that covers several years. So we decided for one year that was um, approximating the historical wind conditions quite well. Um, we did an analysis based on era five reanalysis data, taking basically all the 70 years that were available until then. Um, and looking for years that fit um, reasonably well and then selected the year 2006 that was also used in previous studies, for instance, by DTU that were, was doing um, a study for the Agora Energy Vendor some years ago. Then we define um, scenarios, so areas and um, capacity densities on these areas. We need to lay out the wind farm areas for those, so we need to really place the wind farms uh, in some way in these areas. We do a simulation with the mesoscale model using the Fitch parameterization, and then we an analyze for some key, um, key, uh, um, yeah, KPIs like AEP um, efficiency, full load hours. Um, I come to some re results later. The choice of the model. I mean, I said that already, but we used uh, uh, the Wolf model version four three one. Uh, driven by ERA-5 and the Austrian reanalysis, um, based on also our experience that he had in the European Wind Atlas project um, and the sensitivity studies that were done there. However, here was a resolution of two kilometers covering um, the German Bight area and also the neighboring uh, relevant wind farm areas in Denmark and the Netherlands. Um, luckily, we have um, in, the, in the maritime spatial plans that we were looking at, we Typically, we're seeing um, a gap, let's say, of some installations in the southern part of the Netherlands and here in the northern part. So this was quite fair of doing a certain cut at a certain point um, and not ignoring too many further wake effects from further away. Um, so um, there, this was how we did it. There, um, we used the Fitch wind farm parameterization um, in, in its original form, how it's implemented in the version 4.3.1. Um, and um, yeah, this setup that I just presented was validated also in uh, in this um, scanning LIDAR um, campaign. Yeah, advantage is that we have a physical representation of large scale meteorological conditions in the mesoscale model uh, somehow, we, but we have a low granularity for single wind turbines. Uh, layouts within grid cells are not resolved. However, um, future offshore wind farms with 22 megawatt turbines will mostly only contain one turbine per grid cell. Um, so then in the end, we are already starting to resolve some kind of layouts effects as well. And this is an animation, how this then looked like um, in, in the time domain. So there's a day um, here in December, uh, with quite, which was quite interesting in terms of that there was a storm passing through. And one can see also how the tur the turbines get um, um, yeah into rated power, and I think then even in, in storm shutdowns, so you don't see any any wake effects um, anymore. But in the lower wind conditions earlier that day, um, one can see really how very strong wake effects are developing and lasting over over several um, tens of kilometers downstream of the wind farms. Um, the expansion scenarios, I want to focus here um, on, on one, um, especially one scenario that I'm presenting. Um, that's one of the largest ones that we did, uh, so 70 gigawatt um, expansion scenarios, so 75 gigawatt expansion scenarios um, that was partially based on plans that are in the um, current, uh, current um, Area development plan, um, so uh, Flächenentwicklungsplan is the German word. That's why there's FEP, which is a kind of the German abbreviation for for the area development plan. Um, the scenario here that's um, important uh, to note here does not present a fixed planning, um, and the scenario also exceeds the goals of 70 gigawatts. I explained that already because downtimes of wind farm areas are considered. Um, so downtimes we mean with downtimes we mean potential. Um, yeah, replowering or renew of of, of um, um, areas that are then quite um, quite old already. Um, 
We did detailed studies on the continuous expansion towards the full expansion as well. I have an um, interesting animation how this then also developing later on and interannual yield fluctuations and uncertainties. <clears throat> and um, we also considered neighboring countries, um, especially the, the Dutch wind farms, according to the uh, to earlier plans of the RVO, that's the authority that's responsible in the Netherlands for the wind farm area planning. Um, and there um, we estimated total losses in the order of 3%. So the total losses on all wind farm clusters in the German bite some areas saw um, uh, reductions of more than 15% because actually the, the, the distance between a wind farm cluster um, on the Dutch side and the German side can be between the turbines can even be smaller than the turbine spacing inside the wind farm cluster itself. So they can really be put at the border's edge. And that's why we see there, this is this is really um, a large wind farm cluster um, of, or, or one can, could even see, say that this is a 20 to 25 um, gigawatts wind farm cluster that's then cross-border um, plant. We said here earlier plans because there was also an update on the RVO plans in, in late autumn. We also have a newer um, simulations based on, based on that that are um, publicly available, but I, I concentrate here on some um, results. So one thing that I learned, if you do maritime spatial planning, um, once you have done the simulations, they are more or less outdated already, but that also makes it very interesting on, on updating that all the time. So... To show you how this looks like in terms of the setup, um, we have here the rated power. Here's the rated power shown. Um, so you can see here the, the old areas that are already over operational have um, turbines from uh, 2.5 uh, megawatts um, and then uh, up to, let's say, 5 megawatts. Then we have certain wind farm clusters that get operation op in, in operation um, pretty soon that are then in the order of... Uh, 10 to 10 to 15 megawatts and then we have larger areas um, with 22 megawatt uh, wind farm uh, wind turbines uh, maybe I have to say here that in terms of what uh, what areas um, and what areas to use um, we didn't do any selections by ourselves but that's uh, done by the BSH so we basically took the areas and then put the turbines there according to discussions with them on what makes sense um, here's the wind map shown at 175 meters uh, height um, above sea. So we can see here that especially when moving further towards the central North Sea, we do see increasing wind speeds um, from um, roughly like 9.5 meters, let's say, in the wind farm areas to, to around 11 meters per second. So there is quite quite some some increase here in the in the average wind conditions as well that needs to be taken into account when we look at the results later on that we also have um, higher wind speeds in some areas we see here capacity densities um of um um yeah of four let's say in in, in the older areas up to more than 10 megawatts per square kilometer just to give you numbers, uh, I think the colleagues in Denmark, um, please correct me if I'm wrong, but there we are more looking towards four megawatts per square kilometer. So this will be more than twice as dense as other countries are planning that at the, at the moment. But that takes into account that there is the strong need for electricity in Germany and there's the will to, um, to um, produce as much as possible and get as much as possible out of the German bite. So what does this mean in terms of ambient full load hours? And here, this is basically a reflection of what is shown here in terms of just the, the term full load hours. So we, uh, if there would be no wake effects at all, so no internal and no external wake effects, every turbine is operational in free wind conditions, we would see up to uh, 5,400, 5, a bit more even um, full load hours. And um, the ones that are closer to the coast then um, are, are a bit uh, below 4,800 full load hours. So this is not results from the WAC simulations yet. And now on the next slide, I show you the results from the WAC simulations. So we see um, a an, an total energy yield of uh, 240 terawatt hours that originate from those areas. Um, we uh, That's roughly 50% of the current electricity demand, demand in Germany. Um, but um, yeah, at the moment, we are generating quite a lot of electricity still from coal, um, and uh, the expect and and of course with the further electrification 
um, of uh, of the um, of, of of everything in terms of um, heating. Um, so that's um, the, Germany most most heating is still done with with gas boilers, um, and so with go, moving over to heat pumps and also electrification in the in mobility, uh, we of course the the um, the reference is expected to grow quite a lot um, to even more than double um, within those those years as well. So the share uh, of that will be much lower um, in the future if this should be installed later on. Um, the wind speed reduction is quite significant. So in some areas we see um, yeah thirty percent or even rough a bit more than thirty percent of wind speed reduction um, it's where we have the very dense turbines um, plant, and um, according to that then also very strong uh, um, reduction in full load hours. So so some areas go below three thousand um, full load hours, which seems to be kind of a critical value um, from, from what we saw in this governmental process that had had quite some discussions also with industry. So they were looking at those numbers and when it dropped below 3000, there were there were quite some, um, there was quite some astonishment for some of the areas. Um, this here takes to into, into account, although not shown here. So those all areas that are shown here in, in the, in the, um, the Dutch part of the North Sea are also modeled, but not evaluated here. So the impact here is, is reflected. And in terms of weight loss, there's areas that has more than 50% of weight loss because of very dense planning of wind farms um, here, basically, and then upstream in main wind direction, the Dutch um, wind farms. Um, yes. Next slide um, is then um, another simulation that we did and that um, basically, was we were interested in reflecting on how this is because what what I showed now is a fixed scenario, but we of course this is, has some time development. Um, so what we did here is we simulated always the same wind conditions, so the year 06, like before, but we changed and added further turbines as they should be added um, according to what would be for foreseeable from now according to the plans. Um, so until 2034, we had we have already fixed plans. Um, so up to eight years now in the future, we have plans um, for uh, afterwards. We said we install four gigawatts um, per year. Um, so this was selected by us um, because there is no no plans yet on that. And then you can see here, um, yeah, the animation on on how this is uh, how the wind farms are dropping in, um, and and further ones are are erected, uh, basically moving further out to the North Sea. Um, and here is reflected when they get to the grid in terms of a color code. But what is very interesting here is uh, kind of um, this um, uh, then that was quite neat here is um, basically what we have to look at are different wind farm clusters. So um, they are all named by N1 and so on. So N1, for, in, for instance, is uh, basically this wind farm cluster here that's located closest in this, to the Dutch part of the North, um, North Sea. Um, and here, by the way, you can already see how, how dense those wind farms are in terms of uh, turbine spacing compared also to the plants in the, in the Netherlands. And then you can see here, um, with the with the installations that after certain years, whenever there's something going on, um, there's a significant drop going on, and you can imagine that this is quite relevant for the wind farms that are already operational, but also for the future wind farms um, that uh, areas that are tendered now and will be tendered in the future to get some estimates um, what this also means over time. So how many good years in terms of uh, weight losses you will have, and how many bad years then when the when the wind conditions are reducing further. Um, yeah, so we have that evaluated for every uh, every area um, and um, yeah, getting quite a quite a good quite a lot of feedback at the moment from the industry looking into that, getting questions to us and and also further analysis on that. Yes, so this was kind of um, already the conclusion uh, or the, the, the end of the presentation to some extent, I will have some conclusions, but first of all, um, we try to make quite some data publicly available um, from, from the project. And um, one uh, is the, the LIDAR measurements were partly made available uh, on the Pangea database. The data from the manned flights that I presented partly also with two aircrafts are made available 
um, to the community. Um, we um, out of the project we published um, the Foxes model that was before that an in-house model that we developed over um, over eight years in-house and now we're also able to provide that open source and that's quite nice to see at the moment that there's also quite some comparisons against Flores and Pyvek running. Um, um, so we're, we're very happy about that. That that there is also this. That's also a feedback that I get from the industry that they are looking for multiple solutions for multiple um, models uh, to to also estimate the uncertainties. And um, we have uh, the RAFE initiative, which is an initiative around research at the Alpha Ventus Wind Farm, which was the first um, wind farm in the German Bight. Uh, has uh, project websites, and we have a we have a website on the Crosswex project there, uh, where we um, uh, publish. Um, or we, we try to link and update um, all current publications um, also within the next year. So there's still there's roughly around 10 peer-reviewed publications um, available. Uh, the website will see an update next week um, uh, by, by my colleague. And then we have more than five further ones currently in review. So this will be updated. You can there also find the links um, to the data um, that is made, was made publicly available. In conclusion, um, Germany has quite some ambitious plans for offshore wind farm expansions, but the areas are very limited. So uh, we will likely see the densest plants of wind farms in the world. And we need to plan wisely already now, because if we would place the turbines now uh, further away, then there wouldn't be enough space to, to get the 70 gigawatts in, installed. Um, maybe I sh should have said what the other areas are that we didn't plan any wind farms in. Those are areas that are um, more or less already used by either ship routing or for ship routes or for nature reserve or also military. So there are quite some test areas um, for the NATO and, and for the German military test areas um, in the German Bight. So that boat, boat will potentially never be available for offshore wind farm generation. Um, the um, Crossex project focused on improving and validating models and transferring the knowledge uh, towards efficient wind farm operation and planning. And um, in the in the framework of the project, the, or the in the framework of the project, validated models were used and are still used. So we are happy that we continue this this support um, also at least. Uh, until the end of this year um, with the German BITE, uh, with, with the G German BSH, so the German authority that's responsible for the decision-making uh, for the area development plan. And yeah, I said that many results are publicly available, publications are in preparations. Uh, there will also be, I guess, a number of uh, talk contributions um, this spring that originate from the project. So stay tuned. And to give you a short outlook, um, Jacob, you have mentioned that already when you introduced myself, we, of course, have secured a follow-up project um, that we called uh, C-squared wakes, controlled cluster wakes uh, with a smaller consortium um, where we want to uh, um, understand if there are chances to mitigate uh, those cluster wake effects um, um, by, by yeah, smarter planning, potentially also different turbine technologies, um, and um, and we are also focusing on improving and validating further the wind farm parameterizations because although we did quite some things on winds, the validation on wind farm production is quite poor. Um, and um, yeah, there was the Ostend declaration um, where the North Sea countries, um, so UK, France, Belgium, Netherlands, Germany, Denmark, and Norway, um, decided to install 120 gigawatts by 2030 in the North Sea and 300 gigawatts by 2050. So you see the German share of 70 gigawatts is quite significant on that, but there's much more planned in the North Sea. And you can see here um, how this potentially looks like um, in um, how this might potentially look like in terms of the areas. Um, and uh, I would just need to stress out that one of the next steps that we definitely need is... Um, better cross-border planning. Uh, there the authorities are quite active already, but um, that can of course be enhanced. And also joint research um, between, um, yeah, at least the neighboring countries in the North Sea, but also in the, in the Baltic Sea, where there's also a significant share will be, will be located. And I think that's my last slide. Um, many thanks to the people from the Crosswex project and to the colleagues here at uh, Fraunhofer Iversen, especially Lukas Vollmer, who did quite some work um, that are presented today and to our 
funding and computing power. And I'm looking forward to your questions so, now. Thank you very much, Martin. A very nice presentation of an enormous amount of work. Uh, we have already some questions in, in the chat. Uh, so I'll ask you to go to slide number 18. And uh, I have just before Paul van der Laan has a question. I just have a, a question about you show these uh, streaks at the side of the wind farm. Uh, but this is in, in turbulence intensity uh, in, in the in some of the previous uh, plots, you showed these uh, SAR images where you actually saw some wind speed increases there. Isn't it, isn't it uh, in the wind speed also that you see these streaks or is it only in the turbulence intensity? No, no, no. It's definitely also, you see those streaks also in um, in, in the wind speed. There's also a wind speed signal, but the, the signal is strong as, let's say, in, in turbulence um, quantities, so turbulent quantities. So namely TKE, and I think it was in the the WePuff flights um, first shown also in that in that one yeah. the one of the first papers. Um, I think that was the TKE, and it was we see that also in in numerous uh, modeling results that towards one side of the wind farm we see there an an, an increase um, that's then propagating over over very long distances, but mainly in the turbulence signal. Um, and um, yeah, that's I think quite a quite an interesting feature where definitely it needs also more research on really understanding what's happening there and why those structures are not dissolving <laughs> um, over these large distances. Yeah, but then then um, Mark uh, Paul Fenderlan, would you like to ask your question then? Please? Yeah. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, yes, I do. Yeah, I, I actually had exactly the same question as Jakob, uh, which I wrote in the chat and. I see the same type of streaks in, in RAND simulations, so steady state simulations. And actually in those simulations, those streaks, they keep on growing. They never actually disappear. And that's why I suspect that actually they are numerical problems. So I was wondering if the LES model that you used or your group used includes some damping methods. With those, those results are from Gerald Steinfeld from Forwind. So I, I guess would be best to ask him. So we definitely have some damping methods applied, but he he has a strong focus on setting up the 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 LES simulations properly. So the domains that he's using typically are extremely large to not show any side effects of of speed ups that are due to numerical artifacts. And he has typically also has a strong focus on on eliminating all of those effects um, that that might um, might have a focus on that. Um, and uh, as far as I remember, he's currently also with Gabriele uh, Centarelli um, from Forwind, who's doing his PhD here, uh, focusing on publishing this result. So there will be some more um, more to come on this. Okay, thank you. And uh, Miguel Sanchez Gomez, would you like to ask your question or? Or maybe I can just ask it for you. Uh, Miguel is asking whether you are planning to use uh, WARF with the Fitch uh, scheme for uh, AEP estimation, also for the internal wave effects. Yeah, that's that's interesting. Uh, maybe I, I move to uh, move to a, a slide further on um, later. So I, if I can here move to the full load hours um, um, as an example. So of course, um, some of the operators that are operating wind farms in those areas or are interested in, in operating wind farms in those areas later on, um, are interested in breaking that down to what's happening um, on individual farm level. Um, so those, those areas here um, that are marked here typically consist out of three farms um, or so all of at least one gigawatt size. Um, and um, there is definitely a strong limit into the interpretation of the results on these scales. And what we are um, currently um, working on, um, uh, and there's also a talk contribution by uh, from my group from, from Baltasar Sengers on, um, on combining uh, mesoscale engineering models. So we basically model all, all external wakes with the mesoscale model and then couple at multiple points. So basically the whole mesoscale field 
to the engineering model and can then even be go down to the individual turbine level. There is definitely some um, some issues um, if you if you break that down too small. Um, that's due to this internal wake representation inside the inside the um, the Fitch parameterization. Um, we also recently suggested in that's still an, in a discussion paper, um, a brief communication paper in wind energy science on um, how to improve the Fitch parameterization with respect to this representation um, of power. And um, yeah, it needs more validation on larger scales with larger wind farms and and production data. And that's also something that we are um, we are working on. Last thing, what what one have to take in mind here. So the focus of the BSH, the German authority um, here, is that they are interested in optimizing the whole German byte. And for that, this methodology is quite well suited, or let's say at least much better than it was done before. <laughs> um, while breaking that further down, um, we definitely also need more research on on, on further approaches and, and probably coupling those methods. Okay, there's actually a, a lot of questions. I'll try to combine some of them. Um, so... Uh... Uh, you, I mean, are there some places where you accelerate the flow so you benefit other wind farms? That's Gail 2B asking that. And there's also a question about um, what mitigation measures uh, you, you, you would uh, develop or, or thinking of in, in this, this new project that's uh, Jacob Burrows from EDF asking. So maybe you can combine an answer of, of these two. Yeah, um, of course, it's a simulation of the large scale flow, but we do see in larger gaps um, also some some accelerations um, partly along along the wind farm clusters. Then yes, that that is kind of represented. Um, although for for those studies specifically, I, I guess it makes much more sense to to run a micro scale models where you can much better resolve that. Um, what um, in terms of mitigation measures? Um, so wind farm control is a difficult thing because actually, if wind farm control works from an individual wind farm, you are extracting more energy from the area, and so the cluster wake, which is kind of the effect of the reduction of the flow on the overall area, would then even be larger. So that's why um, we are taking this into account, um, uh, this topic. But um, I don't see that we would potentially um, see there some 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 impacts, uh, some some larger impacts on wind farm control. But what we have larger uh, rather in mind is working with low induction turbines, also potentially turbines with different hub heights um, that are reaching further out um, towards the atmosphere. Um, there um, and and where you can then also see that we get some better mixing, um, especially in stable stratification, some more mixing from from the upper atmosphere into the bound into the wind farm boundary layer. So these are the mitigation methods where I'm more thinking about that might be real more realistic to get out more from the areas. Yes. Okay. Then uh, there's a a question from. Um... Jim Passer, what about shipping? I mean, what what is, there must be a significant impact on shipping. Do, can you comment on that? I mean, there's not. So there there, there are some discussions in the sailor the the, the sailing community <laughs> that uh, in, especially in the Baltic Sea where this is uh, that's well known for tourism also with sailings um but there, there in some cases we even so if you resolve that with some micro scale models we even see speed ups be, from below the rotor that that are happening um, close to the wind farms so maybe this makes the flow more interesting in terms of the, those large shipping routes, the discussion is a bit much more on potential hazards and risk if, if there might be accidents uh, ongoing. And that's really the discussion on, so this this ship route here, actually there was there were plans of placing those wind farm areas here in the center of the ship route and then making, let's say one direction, the other direction here. And um, that one, I think it's more unlikely um, because of this, the, the, the yeah, a stronger hazard of just having a more accidents and collisions with, with turbines. Well, we have maybe just a last question, which is a little bit different from uh, uh, Jim Wilsack. Uh, did you in Crosswakes or any of the other projects uh, look on ocean stratification currents or sediment transport? And are these issues of concern in Germany? Not yet. 
let's say. So we are, um, yeah, we hope that we get some future activities also together to have a have a stronger focus on that. I think wasn't weren't there some activities in in, in at DTU um, on that a bit more, but here in, in the German, but this has not been in terms of research not not the um, um, a topic so far, but definitely something that we need to understand better. Also, the whole topic of of um, interaction with the marine environment um, is one of the of the big next steps um, that we where we need to make some progress. Okay, there's still a lot of questions, but I'm afraid we cannot uh, uh, do more right now. But uh, thank you very much, Martin, for a very nice presentation and, and that generated a lot of, of good questions. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you as well. And I just have the last slide with my email address on it. So more than happy to answer later on um, by email. Um, so please just drop me an email. Thanks a lot. Okay. okay, and thanks so much. And uh, we are still looking for a speaker for uh, the May 8th slot. Um, so if we have anybody here who would love to present their work, uh, please let Jakob or I know. And thank you, everyone. <laughs>